Amen, amen. Again, we want to um, thank um, Christ Cove for having us. This is always a joy. Mez couldn't say it any better. Is that church is willing to have the conversation we um, we really, really appreciate. So often, um, so often the urban pastor is ignored in the church, um, in larger churches in terms of partnership. So when um, uh, a church invites us, it's, it's great. So my name is Doug Logan. I serve as the president of Grimke Seminary, Dean of the School of Urban Ministry. Uh, man, I love my wife, been married since 96, got three, three boys, all adults, three daughter-in-laws, four grandkids and one great grand. And um, man, um, just honored of where God has placed me and my family and God honored that many of grands and greats and sons have all served with me, um, two of which serve in ministry um, currently. So a little background about me. I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. If you're, if you're over 40, you probably saw a movie called Lean On Me. Anybody ever see that movie with Joe Clark? Well, that's where I'm from. I'm from Patterson. Let me start the timer. I planted and I served in Epiphany, Philly, um, in North Philadelphia with Dr. Eric Mason, who launched me and sent me to plant Epiphany Camden in Camden, New Jersey, America's most dangerous, most violent, most poor city, um, probably for about 15 out of the past 25 years. Planted there in 2011. And from there, Dr. Mason and I prayed that God would bless us to plant churches in the top 20 most dangerous cities in America. And by God's grace, um, out of Epiphany Camden, we planted nine churches um, in Epiphany Baltimore, Epiphany Bronx, Epiphany Delaware, um, Epiphany Brooklyn, Epiphany Crenshaw. And we planted all throughout those dangerous cities because we believe that um, um, all of our efforts into poor communities, they fall short without the gospel and a church where this gospel can be preached and discipleship can be established because the call of the Great Commission sends us to the block um, to get after the lost. And so around 2015, me and Mez wrote, Mez wrote his book, um, Church in Our Places, and around that same time, I wrote a book called On the Block, Developing a Picture, Developing a um, Biblical Picture for Missional Engagement, which was about urban ministry. Um, so in that context, um, um, I'll just, that's where I'm coming from. So I am coming from an American context. Mez is coming from a European, largely super impoverished in the schemes, which would be equivalent to our projects. So the Mez laid out a foundation of the challenge I want to lay out as a president of a seminary and, and a professor and an educator that one of the reasons why we lack churches in these communities is because they lack understanding and training. If you've been to seminary, you can go to seminary, your whole 109 credit RTS, Westminster, Covenant, all the Southerns, and you can not take one class on, a cl on poverty. You can go the whole time and not take a class on poverty. You can go that whole 109 credits and not have a non-white author in not one of your books. Therefore, why aren't we having churches in the hood? Why would I go if I'm ill-equipped? And then if I get to the seminary and Christ Covenant hires me, why would I give up concrete floors and swag? I wouldn't. I'd work for Pastor D's and overcharge him. And if it didn't go right, I'd pull a race card and get a raise. <laughs> but I'd just rather train some people and get them to Atlanta that we can plant in the grimiest cracks and crevices of this block so that the Atlanta Hawks aren't the most famous. Jesus is the most famous on the block. So let me walk us out. And I just want to talk about seven ways poverty, seven ways people are experiencing poverty in America. Oh, and last thing I want to say is, before I jump in here, is the book Least Last and Lost, the American version, is designed to have this conversation. You remember, when we come in to have this conversation, a lot of white, larger, middle-class churches hang up on us. They say, here they go with that CRT. Here they go with that social warrior stuff. Here they go with that Marxist. Here they go with that, with that, with that black stuff. Here they go. Here they go. 
I like to go with the Bible. And so the conversation's not had, because soon as we have it, they think we're on some D-I-E. I know y'all say D-E-I, but I say D-I-E, because you'll die if you do that ridiculous stuff without Jesus. Therefore, the book is to help us be a bridge to the conversation so that more people will grasp what we're trying to say because it's a biblical reality. Let me start with this. Jesus identified with the poor. Um, and it's evident from his life. He proclaimed his solidarity with the poor, the powerless on the earth, in his birth and in the way he lived. Foxes have dens and birds um, birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Paul, the Apostle Paul, proclaims poverty of Jesus so beautifully. He says, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. And his coming, the coming of Jesus, pre announced precisely within the context of God's um, in the context of the reality of the poor, he says this in Luke 1, 53, the hungry he has filled with good things, the rich he has sent away empty. So these concepts here is Jesus has a lot to say about the poor, and therefore the church must have a lot to say about reaching the poor. So, but I want to also lay out that poverty in America, and Mez brought that out clearly, is a multifaceted issue that affects millions of people, both urban and rural areas. And it's very complex. It's not clean. It requires some dynamic explanation. It's more than just a, a theological proposition. It's, it is that, but it's not just that. And it requires some explanation and a walkout because the landscape by which it's been explained in our evangelical circles has been not biblical. Our picture of the poor has not often been a biblical picture. Because if it was, why were we saying the poor? I don't say the white. I don't say, let's take a class. When you go to Southern Seminary, you don't take a class in suburban ministry. You don't take a class in middle class ministry, but you do take one in urban ministry. So the modifier in itself makes it the side hustle, not the ribeye. So let's try to have this conversation, but it's been complex. So the book is designed for that. And poverty can't be simply boiled down to statistics on a paper or accurately measured solely on the results of surveys conveying income and expenditures. Real people behind these numbers live in often with distressing personal circumstances. To quote the World Bank, it says this, poverty is hunger. Poverty is a lack of shelter. Poverty is being sick and not being able to see a doctor. Poverty is not having access to schools and not knowing how to read. Poverty is having a job, is not having a job, is fear of the future, living one day at a time. Poverty is losing a child to illness brought about by unclean water. Poverty is powerlessness, lack of representation and freedom. Let's walk out a few things. What, how are people experiencing poverty in America? Well, financial insecurity is one. One of the primary aspects is financial insecurity. Does come in flowing out of an inadequate income to cover just daily expenses and emergencies. This comes down to groceries, the essentials of just needs. That it, and this, this, this financial insecurity is exacerbated by a, a lack of stable, well-paying jobs and the prevalence of um, the brokenness that comes in the multi-generation that poverty creates, um, there just becomes multi-generational poverty. In Camden, New Jersey, where I pastored, um, I've seen three generations of welfare, three generations of unemployment, three generations of multiple just brokenness, lack of education, three generations. I had three generations in my church, three generations under 37. I had three generations in my church. 
It's that bad cycle of poverty and that financial insecurity is bred. Second, healthcare access. Limited access to affordable health care is another critical dimension of poverty. Folks stay sick in the hood. We got the worst food. The average person in Camden, New Jersey, eats three times a day during school year, during the summer, because during the school year, they eat three meals at school. They have the breakfast snack, the children have the lunch, and then you have a snack almost at the end of the day going out. Once summer comes, kids are averaging eating three meals a week at their house, three meals a week in the summer. They can't wait to get back to school so they can eat food. So healthcare access. And remember, we got a pastor in this. Not, this is not a social, a, a social agenda. We have to pastor people through this. And that's why Ritalin is easy to prescribe. ADHD is easy to diagnose for many. Autism spectrum can be ignored and misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed from bad health, bad health care. Now we have a multi-generation undiagnosed autism and ADHD issues that perpetuate poverty even to the next generation. Education disparities um, significantly affect economic opportunities. Children with, um, from impoverished families tend to attend underfunded schools with fewer resources which impact their academic performance. I'll give you an example. Uh, the, pres- the principal from the school said to me, Pastor Diddy, everybody calls me Pastor Diddy, he said, Pastor Diddy, um, we don't have dictionaries. So we raised $10,000 to buy dictionaries for the school. And, and then they couldn't afford Freon. We helped them with Freon. It's real that education is the piece, is one of the key pieces. I'll give you an, I gotta keep moving, but a rich dude laid out a a, a million dollars before he died outside of Camden in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And he said, anybody, Camden High is one of the roughest high schools in America. He said, anybody who goes to Camden High and graduates, graduation rate is like 46%, and then goes on to an Ivy League school and to a PhD in science. I will pay for them all the way through. Well, you know that million dollars ain't been spent in 35 years, right? What a high thing. You gotta go and you gotta do this and you gotta do this. That money is untouched. The interest is ridiculous. There's an organization that runs their organization off the interest because that money has not been spent. So the education they need gets pigeon held into a rich dude deciding what fixes the hood. We got to do better. Food insecurity. We just got bad food. From Chinese to Chinese food to cheesesteaks that leads back to the bad health, that perpetuates our diabetes, um, dental issues, all these things flow out of there. And that cycle of poverty keeps the emergency room lit. You know, my father would say, my primary care doctor is emergency room. <laughs> We from the hood. We went to the emergency room for everything. And then the Tylenol was $377. Um, and he would give him a fake name. So, but then the food insecurity, housing instability. Average person in Camden, New Jersey lives in a rental for about 17 months. So the average person is so transient. You live there about 17 months. Try to plant a church and make a disciple in 17 months. That's generally how long you got them. And on top of the, the moving around, there's a, a homeless pandemic, homelessness pandemic that is often not met like Mez McConnell meets. See, Mez McConnell's a crazy person. Mez McConnell takes people off the street, moves them in the house. Um, I'm a little too bougie for that, um, but I do get them off the street, just not in my house. I get them in a house, just not my house. And um, I'm joking, but... In the U.S. as of January 2020, 58, 580,000 people are experiencing homelessness across the rough streets of urban America. Almost 600,000 people. Over half a million families, individuals. This is heartbreaking. And children are in this number. And homelessness fosters the rest of the list. Bad food, education, 
And then the cycle just continues. All of this then per is perpetuated onto the streets that me and you now see on the news in the violence and the murder. Here comes the new family since the family is broken. The gang is the new family. The streets are the new family. Where the church is supposed to be the new family. Violence within the impoverished neighbors often leads to social exclusion, limiting individuals' ability to participate fully in society. This can manifest in reduced access to recreational facilities, cultural events, and social networks. PTSD impacts mental health and diminishes the standard of life functionality. I can relate to this directly as when I moved to Richmond out of Camden, I experienced my own PTSDs. I watched many kids die. I watched I was one of the first on the scene at a decapitation. I was one of the first on the scene of a man murdering his wife at a church because he was Muslim and she was going to church. I was one of the first on the scene of multiple murders, multiple violence. I've been at the house and my door has been knocked on more than multi multiple times for Pastor Doug is another one dead. I've done more funerals than weddings. I've seen death after death. I've seen murder after murder. I've seen crime after crime, rape after rape. The PTSDs I experienced, the depression, I could barely get out of the bed and I was too hurt to even cry. And I'm a pastor with access. Paul Tripp is my spiritual father. I'm a pastor with access to the gospel guru, the gospel Yoda, Paul Tripp. And I still was paralyzed by PTSDs, so much so my wife had to call somebody to move me out of New Jersey to Richmond, Virginia. And yet and still, like Paul, I'm concerned about the church. Eldon Villafanye says this, I'm concerned for a city, particularly the in, that inner city um, reality that is being shaken in the by the mindless violence of its youth and undermined by the cold indifference of institutional violence. I am concerned with a church that has no mind for a holistic vision for the city. So what am I screaming? I'm screaming we need a holistic vision for the city, not just a felt needs thing, because the last thing I want to do is send somebody to hell with a good coat and a full stomach. The gospel is the healer. The gospel is the hope. The gospel is all we got. And I like the gospel with a coat. I like the gospel with some soup, but I don't like soup by itself. And Pastor Dee told me that we have a great commandment and a great commission. And those two, how they interact and how they marry, that must be our heart. When they get Jesus and some soup, now we have some hope. But we, can, what we must be gospel-centered, not poverty-centered. We must be gospel-centered, not mercy ministry-centered must see people converted, not just full and warm. I like full and warm. Don't hear me knocking full and warm. I, was, I needed to be full and warm until I got saved. Perkins, Dr. Perkins says, you got to keep people lo alive long enough till faith comes. <laughs> and then I'll land the plane and say this, through over-spiritualizing, What's one of the challenges? It's the over-spiritualizing and the under-spiritualizing of poverty by the church. Many evangelical churches either in America either over-spiritualize poor communities or under-spiritualize them. When these churches over-spiritualize poor communities, the practical needs of the whole person in the poor community is often neglected and ignored. Then they think all about healing their souls and saving sinners. The gospel is not only meant to get people to heaven, but to keep them out of hellish lives. At the same time, some evangelical churches take an under-spiritualized approach to reaching poor communities. They think that it's all about fixing their situation and not pointing them to the Savior. The mindset is that if poor communities can be physically restored, then they can find soulful rest. Both approaches are unbiblical. While each approach does address important needs and issues that, that are a reality of poor communities, the whole person must be physically and spiritually restored. We must call this type we must do this. We must walk this out and not walk in this unbiblical dichotomy. Doug Logan, let me drive it right down the street. At, I, I do a lot of 
home repairs. I've lived in a lot of raggedy houses, so I've had to fix stuff myself because I don't have no money. And so therefore, one thing I used to do, I'm old enough, I'm 53, I used to have to put primer on the wall. Y'all remember those days? And then you had to, then after you put the primer on, you had to do the paint. Home Depot makes paint in the primer. So often ministry can be this spiritual thing that says, get them saved. That's, that can be the paint or the primer. And then after we get them saved, now we get them fed. That's the primer. That's the paint. Or we feed them. That's the primer. And then we get them saved. That's the paint. Let's just do that in the same can now. Let's roll out the paint in the primer from the same hearts of Christ's covenant. Let's roll out the paint in the primer in Atlanta at the same time. The gospel, love, we can do a sandwich and the Savior at the same time. Then I think we'll have some impact. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, and it's a gospel word. I want to make sure. Kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord, and he will give a reward to the lender. That verse is in the context of gospel ministry. Come on, brother. Come on, brother. I'm done. So we want to plant some churches. But my, the heart of my talk today was everything I said, many people who want to plant churches in the hood have never heard. So we started a school so we can train them so they'll want to go. Amen. Come on up, Pastor.